Good afternoon, everyone. Our next speaker in the room is uh, Aaron Evanchik, and the title of his talk is Hacking Cars with Python. So please give a warm welcome to Aaron. Hello. Welcome to the last talk slot. Thank you for sticking around for this one. Uh, my name is Eric Evanchik, and yeah, today we'll be talking about hacking cars with Python. A little bit about me. Uh, I do security research for a firm called Atretis Partners. We do a lot of stuff with like mobile and embedded. And sort of historically, I've done a lot of car security things, which is what we're talking about today. I also have a little company up in Canada called Linklayer Labs that builds open source hardware, which we'll talk about a little bit today. And I also write for this website called hackaday.com, which I encourage you all to read as a shameless plug. Uh, it's a blog about hardware hacking and, and such. But uh, that's kind of enough about me. What I'm curious about always when I talk about this is has anyone here done anything in the car hacking space? Have you ever sent or received CAN bus stuff? There's a few hands, that's cool. And uh, I assume like some people here probably use Python. So it's kind of a good audience, you know, not too much about cars, but lots about Python, and we'll, we'll go with that. A uh, little disclaimer though, um, I don't want you to break your car. And some of the diagnostic stuff that you can do to cars gives you really high level access and you literally can brick, brick things. Uh, you can also modify safety critical systems, which is bad because you, know, you don't want don't to do that when you're inside of a car. Uh, it might be illegal if you, say, reset an odometer or change VIN numbers. That's, that's not cool. So like, don't do those things and proceed at your own risk and don't blame me. Uh, yeah. So first thing about cars, they're computers nowadays. They're, they're just robots that you happen to sit inside of. And this happened for a few reasons. The first one is safety. You're probably familiar with you know, airbags and other safety advances that have come into cars. One thing you might not know is that airbags are like really complex nowadays. Some of them will actually detect things like how heavy the occupant is, where their seat is, whether their seatbelt is actually done up, and so on and so forth before firing the airbag. And then using that data, they actually determine how f hard they should fire the airbag to provide the best you know, crash resistance. Uh, so you need a computer to do that. You can't, can't do that with a mechanical system. Advanced features, of course. We have the Tesla autopilot there, and also the infotainment systems, generally called ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems in the industry. And these are things like your auto braking, your adaptive cruise. You, know, you need computers to pull that off. But the real reason is actually emissions. This is why we got electronic engine controls in the first place. There was requirements that went in to say, hey, you need to make those cars more efficient. You need them to do less emissions. So figure it out. And the automotive companies went off and figured out all this cool stuff, like exhaust gas recirculation and all sorts of fancy ways of controlling engines, fuel injection. Uh, the problem was it was hard to do. So they needed computers to make it work. But cars are also networks. In fact, there's a lot of computers in a car. Up to 100 in a fancy car. Like, the fancier your car is, the more computers it has. It's just a rule of thumb. You know, the engine controller, if your car has an internal combustion engine, it probably has an engine controller. If your car is on, like, the super high end, it might have, and I've literally seen this in a car, an aromatherapy unit. Uh, <laughs> and that actually could be connected to the car's network. Automotive networks nowadays, they're typically CAN bus, controller area network. That'll come up a lot, I'll call it CAN. It's one way of networking stuff together. There's a few older technologies, there's some newer technologies, but by and large, things are still CAN. And this just shows you like why there's so many computers. We have door controllers, we have airbag controllers, we have an engine controller, radio, infotainment, uh, telematics for like OnStar and things like that, uh, body controls, so on and so forth, tons of parts, they all have to talk. So that brings us to CAN bus, and it's important to understand a little bit about this if you're going to play with cars. It's controller area network, and the reason it exists for cars is because it's cheap, and the automotive industry is all about saving money. Uh, it's really cheap to network things together, because unlike Ethernet, you don't need a Fi or a Mac, really. You just need this like cheap little transceiver chip. The controller for it is on board of all these microcontrollers. You know, for a dollar, you can get one of these microcontrollers, like 10, 20 cents. You have a transceiver, you're good to go. And there's a bunch of different types. So most you see is high speed. This is a differential thing. So kind of like Ethernet, you twist the wires together. Uh, there's a low speed, which is single-ended. That's when you want to be even cheaper. 
uh, fault tolerant cans used in things like airbags for safety, and there's this new can flexible data thing that lets you send more data faster. But a typical structure you'll see is a bunch of controllers that do important things on a differential high speed CAN bus in green here, like your engine, anti lock brakes, those are kind of important, we want those to work quickly. Uh, and transmission also needs to know about the engine pretty fast. Then you'll have controllers that gateway messages through to a different CAN bus. In this case, it's a body control module that then gateways some of that across to say the instrument panel or the door modules. And that's the topology that you see, except in more complex vehicles, you might have up to you know, five, six different CAN buses that are all gatewayed together in, in crazy ways. But CAN itself is really simple. Uh, it's a protocol that you can like, learn in a day, because it only has like, three things you need to know about. Uh, you have controllers, and these are nodes in the network, so an engine control unit might be one controller, a body control unit might be another one, uh, so on and so forth. They're all just connected together on this big wire, that's the bus, so this collection of them is called a bus. And a frame, you only really have to care about three things. Uh, there's an ID, and that's just a number that says this is what this frame means. There is a data length code that tells you how many bytes are in that frame. You can only have up to eight. And then there are eight bytes of data. That's it, it's just ID, data length code, data. If you're a programmer, that's all you have to care about. If you're doing like electrical stuff, it's com more complicated, but that's it, it's just, you know, you have an ID, you have your eight bytes, you look at them, you get your data out. There's two ways this is used. One is just operational data, is what I like to call it, and this is what's happening all the time in your car. Things are periodically broadcasting messages, and they're being picked up by other controllers that want to know about that particular thing, and then they use that to make decisions. One example, and we'll use this a bit, is your engine controller may broadcast the engine speed and revolutions per minute, your instrument panel might pick that up and display it on a tachometer. If you have a car that still has a tachometer, they're kind of going away, but that's one example. This obviously, that's a very simple example. You have more complex things, like you might have a yaw rate sensor that is then connected to your traction control system and is measuring the yaw of the car, then another sensor that's measuring the steering angle. It's receiving those two things, yaw and steering angle, over the CAN bus periodically being broadcast, and whenever it thinks that you're steering this way and you're yelling the other way, it's going to take some corrective action. So that's how the operational data works, just fixed broadcast times, 10 milliseconds for one message, 100 for another maybe, based on how important it is. Really simple. Diagnostics is the more complicated one, but also the more fun one to play with. It's used during specific times and allows for like special interactions that you shouldn't have normally, and it's a client server approach. So this operational data, again, it's broadcast, it's periodic, and it makes all the normal stuff that happens when you're driving your car work, and you never think about it. It's just like, you know, you turn the key, and there's lots of CAN messages flying around, but don't worry about it, your car still works. They use proprietary encoding for this using a CAN database. This is just saying that for this ID and these bytes, it has this meaning. And we can show how that works in a moment, but what it lets us do as people hacking cars is get information about the vehicle if we can decode the messages. We can log that data and find out, you know, hmm, how's my engine performing? Or how's my electric vehicle battery degrading? Things like that. And also we can control components by sending them our own messages and tricking them into doing what we want them to do. So the way this works, engine control module in this example, that same eight byte frame. And we would have this can database file, which is just a big, text file actually, that tells us how to decode every one of these frames. And in this case, it might tell us that bytes zero and one are engine RPM, then we get OX5DC, it's gonna tell us the endedness, it's gonna tell us if it's signed and things like that. But let's just take a simple example, 5DC, convert that to decimal, 1500 RPM. So the instrument cluster will see that message and move your tachometer to 1500 RPM, telling you that your engine is in fact spinning. Now you can also mess with it and tell it that it's spinning a lot faster. So in this example, it's an injection that we're doing and actually telling it that it's doing 8,000 RPM. But the real fun part of this picture is this car actually has no engine in it at all. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we're, just, we're just having fun. And this is kind of a silly example, but practical things that I've done with this is you pull a power steering module out of one car, you wanna use it in a different car. You need to tell it that it has 12 volt power, that the engine is running, 
wants to know these things so it doesn't kill your 12 volt battery. And you also need to tell it how fast the car is going because it will apply a lot of torque when you're going slow and not so much when you're going fast so you don't flip the car over. And yeah, you can actually implement those things yourself and take a power steering module and put it on a bench or whatever you'd like to do. Diagnostics. This is used during manufacturing, service, end of life, and forensics. Manufacturing to set your car up, service to figure out what's wrong with it, end of life to deploy your airbags, oddly enough, and forensics for if your airbags go off, they can actually get some cool data about why you crashed. Um, it allows like, for a ton of features, and we're gonna talk about them, but it usually requires special tools. That's a GM Tech 2. It is one of the GM tools. It is rather expensive. So, first thing we need to know about diagnostics is this ISOTP. Uh, I said that CAN is eight bytes, and that's a problem because VIN numbers are longer than eight bytes, and you might wanna send a VIN number over CAN. VIN number being a vehicle identification number. Every car has a unique one. So that's you know, displayed on your windshield, but how do we send this 17 character thing in eight bytes? Well, we just combine some frames together, and ISOTP, also called CANTP, is just a transport protocol that lets us do that. So it allows 4,095 whole bytes of transmission and flow control, makes the whole thing work. It's really nice when you're trying to do firmware updates, because doing those eight bytes at a time is not, not fun. So once we have the ability to send 4,095 bytes, we need to get into the standards. I can't talk about all of them because there's a million of them, but basically all cars nowadays will do OBD2, and this is the one that you're probably familiar with if you've ever played with cars, and they'll do Unified Diagnostic Services, and this is one that you probably aren't familiar with unless you worked in the automotive industry or have played with this a lot. Um, there's other older ones, J1850 uh, and ISO 9141. Some of these are still used a bit, but they're not based on CAN, and I don't have time to talk about them. OBD2, this is the simplest thing to play with with a car. If you own a car, you might want to do this to save yourself some money, if anything else. Uh, you can read all these nice parameters about your car, like how fast is my engine spinning? How fast am I going? You can plot them and log them using some cool apps, at least on Android. You can also clear fault codes. So when that silly check engine light comes on, you can turn it off, and then it might come on again, and then you have a real problem. But, you know, save you the 50 bucks to get someone to actually do it for you. And you can get the best reference of this is that Wikipedia page uh, of OBD2 PIDs. It has everything you can request. It's, it's a beautiful Wikipedia page. I always refer people there, and yeah, it has all, everything you need. You can buy one of these cheap interfaces. That's a Bluetooth one, and get going pretty quick. But you might get bored. But how does OBD work? Well, okay, we have a mode and a parameter ID. So we say, you know, mode one is request some current data. We say, I want to request parameter D, uh, ID OXOC or something like that. Send that off to our engine control unit, which is a server in this case. It looks at that and then sends us back the current data. So it sends mode adding OX40 to say this is a response. It echoes that PID so we know what we're actually getting, and then it sends us the data. It's, it's a really simple request response structure. But you might, yeah, you might get bored of OBD because like it's a finite list of these things, and you know, yeah, well. Once you go through them, it's like, I want more. Well, Unified Diagnostic Services is more. It is what the actual OEM uses for their diagnostic tools. You have a client and a server. Again, the client is the tool you're plugging in, and the server is this engine control unit. And it defines four of these functional units that contain a total of 25 services. We'll go over them pretty quick just to talk about the cool ones. And it's available from the ISO as a PDF. But that PDF costs 198. I believe it's Czech, or no, not Czech, Swiss, Swiss francs. Is that CHF? Uh, yeah, that's a lot of money for a PDF document. And you know, it's illegal for me to just give it to you. So that's why, while we get to the Python part of this, it's more fun to implement that in Python than just hand around PDFs. So how does UDS work? Very similar. We say, I want to do this service. It has an ID. And here are the parameters. You send that off to the controller. It thinks about it a bit and then sends you back a response. You need to know how the service works to know how to encode those request parameters and how to decode those response parameters. Unfortunately, you're going to have to buy the PDF and implement this all yourself in order to make that work. But there's lots of fun things you can do once you get there. Uh, there's this first functional unit, which is all just about setting up the session. So, you know, getting into the right mode, getting security access if you need it. You can reset them and change the bit rates and, and all that sort of stuff. Not much fun in here, it's just, you know, set up. 
But then we get to the cool stuff. So there's just read data by identifier. There's just arbitrary IDs mapping to blocks of data, and you can read them. You can also write some of them, which would change the functionality of that controller. Kind of exciting. You can also read and write memory addresses if that functionality is enabled. And some controllers leave that functionality enabled. You can dump blocks of memory out of the controller. Pretty good if you're reverse engineering a system. And there's some other you know, scaling data to figure out how to convert to engineering units and periodic data identifiers will broadcast stuff to you. But yeah, this is the basic way to get data in and out. You can do fault codes. So you can read your fault codes, you can clear your fault codes. Uh, useful if you're trying to fix a car. Nowadays, you basically can't diagnose a car without being able to look at fault codes. There's also input-output control. This should never be enabled in production. <laughs> Because what it does is it lets you just like control the output pins of the ECU. So you can just say like, I would like pin five to go high right now and it will do it. Uh, in practice, not a good idea. Uh, routine control is very exciting. It does everything from let you recalibrate sensors to in fact deploy your airbags whenever you're in the special state at end of life. It just lets you run test routines that they left on those controllers. And you, know, you can choose one by index and tell it to start and it will do, do something. You don't necessarily know what it's going to do, but uh, <laughs> you can run them. And uh, yeah, the last thing is actually maybe the most scary. It's actually upload and download data. So this is how you change firmware on those controllers. And yeah, you can actually rewrite firmware to the engine controller in your car. Up until very recently, most of that firmware was not signed or anything. So you can actually just load your own program onto your, you know, onto your controller and, and have a good time. Uh, so there's a request upload and download, you transfer some data, you request a transfer exit, and you're done. But that's a lot of services, and you probably don't want to figure them all out yourself. So let's talk about the tools, and this is, I promise, where we get to Python. Um, starting with hardware, you know, the official, like the Tech 2 is expensive. The cheap options, they do OBD. I recommend you get one if you're playing with cars. They're cheap. Uh, go on Amazon and search for like OBD2 dongle, and you'll find a bunch of them for 10 bucks. You can also use a CAN to USB adapter. I happen to make one that's open source. It's ugh, this guy called CANTACT, and uh, it will do that for you. The problem is it only does CAN, and you still need to do this ISOTP thing, and then you need to do the UDS stuff, and that sounds hard. So let's use Python. Uh, and I came up with a bunch of scripts for doing this, then finally decided that they might be useful for somebody else, and then tried to make it into a library. So if you look at this and think, yeah, this is some interesting Python code that sucks. That's probably true. Um, <laughs> but I've been trying to make it better, and you know, if, if people are interested in cars and want to play with it, and you want to help make it better, that would be great. Uh, so Python Vehicle Interface Toolkit. The whole idea is to provide ways to talk to cars in Python. It does CAN, it does the ISOTP stuff, and it also does UDS. And it makes your life a lot easier, because if you want to request, for example, an ECU serial number, that's a standardized data identifier that you need to read. So you need to set up the interface. We'll omit that for brevity. But uh, you set up your interface. You then say, I would like to request OXF18C. And it comes back with a data record. And that's actually the serial number. It's just encoded as bytes there. You smash them together. You get a 32-bit 32, uh, 32 serial number for that part. Another simple example, if you want to make your dashboard light up like a Christmas tree, uh, you can reset all the controllers in your car using the ECU reset service. This is usually pretty safe, as long as you're not actually running your engine while you reset the controller. Don't recommend that. Uh, you can do a hard reset or a soft reset. There's various types. But this library also aims to implement all of those kind of enums that you need that are only in this PDF that you need to buy. So you can do, you know, EC reset, dot reset type, dot hard reset. And in IPython, you just keep hitting tab until you get the one that you want. So it's actually pretty easy to use. Uh, and that's, that's how I play with cars nowadays. Uh, th so this is, you know, this is fun to play around. You can go into IPython, set up your device, and make requests, get, get this sort of stuff. And that was kind of where I was at with this until, you know, once I had it done and actually had UDS implemented, I was like, cool, now I can build all these tools. And that's, that's where I'm at now. So one tool that I've wanted forever. This slide's not supposed to make sense. That's actually kind of the point. It's one tool I've wanted forever is when you record one of these diagnostic tools, the expensive official ones, 
you know, you might get it for like a day and you can play around with it. So you record all these traces. What you're actually looking at here is a timestamp, a can ID, and then a bunch of data represented as hex. So like you have it for a day and you like push all the buttons on it and you record all these logs and then you have to look at them and figure out what they mean. And it's not fun. Uh, so in orange you have the ISOTP stuff and then you have your service IDs and then there's some negative responses in there, you have to filter those out. And then also like the memory management on these devices is pretty funny. So you'll see you know, some bytes like the, the 32, 36, 38, 32 repeats itself a few times. That's just because they don't replace those bit bytes in the buffer and you just need to ignore them. You need to know to do that and it, you know, this is a mess. So at a certain point you just realize that you need a tool. Uh, <laughs> and so this is currently as an example and I want to roll it out into a full tool. It takes literally that data and turns it into this, which is way more readable. You know, okay, I'm doing diagnostic session control with session type three and this parameter record, and then I'm doing it again because that's what this tool did. And then I'm doing a redid of identifier, I get back 0513, and then I do another redid of identifier and get back this stuff, which comes out to that ASCII string, and you just keep going. You can just, you can keep doing this for, for all sorts of stuff. But this was actually from reverse engineering of a CDR tool, so it's a crash data recording tool. Your car has a black box in it, hate to break it to you, and it's actually the airbag unit, so if you crash your car, it's going to restore or record about five seconds of data on what you were doing with the pedals, how fast you were going, was your seatbelt done up, uh, what was the actual acceleration profile of the crash, what airbags deployed, so on and so forth. Uh, depends on the car, some cars support more of these, some cars support less, but it can be a lot of data. This tool pulls all that data out, so we were trying to reverse engineer those to be able to pull it out ourselves. And so actually if you take this ASCII string and you slam it into Google, you'll find that's actually the part number for the occupant restraint module we were looking at, and you can buy one for $188 from Mopar. Uh, kind of useful if you need a new airbag module. But yeah, this tool is still like very, you know, demo, uh, comes out as as text, but uh, you know, to live dangerously here, we can we can do it with some more, with some more uh, cars. So this is this is apparently an Audi A4. We can do this on, and we'll get out you know some different. It works very differently. We see we have this routine control instead, so that's a different service. And actually, we see an error code come up. It's a request out of range. So likely this was actually probing about some status for an airbag that this car didn't have. So it just says. Uh, not there, sorry. Uh, so that's a different, you know, different way that a different vendor has implemented that. We can also look at, uh, there's a Prius. These guys are tricky. Uh, they use an unknown service. They use their own special proprietary service, but we can actually still see, you know, the data that was sent and received and get kind of an idea of how that's working. Uh, what else do we have? I like looking at these. Uh, a Nissan Versa. This one actually does read a memory by address. So the way that they read out this airbag data is they peek at memory addresses inside of your airbag controller and uh, you know, read 32 bytes at a time out of it. I haven't had the guts to try to do a write memory ad by address on an airbag module, but might be enabled, who knows. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's how that one works. And this is much nicer than looking at like, uh, you know, looking at that, I, I think anyway. Um, so it's a cool tool if you have something, to, a diagnostic thing to play with, just take a log and you know, run it through here and you get that out. And it's just a first example of once you have decent tools written for this, you know, how you can implement stuff on top. So a little bit of, of conclusions, uh, practical stuff, because I'd like to leave people with something to do. You should get an OBD2 device if you own a car, because that one time your check engine light comes on and you want to know, you can, you can read the fault code. Kind of useful. They're $10, why not? Uh, right to repair. If you happen to be into this stuff, you will be happy to know that there are some legal fights going on to give you the right to be able to do this. Uh, you should look up right to repair in your state and see what's happening because I'm a Canadian, but the US kind of dictates how this works. So please help us with right to repair. Um, and if you're interested in the community, open garages, 
is an awesome community of people hacking cars. And if you're at DEF CON, the DEF CON car hacking village is like a hands-on, have fun with cars. It's a great time. They have like a capture the flag. They have all sorts of stuff. Uh, and I'm usually hanging out there, so please do say hi. The future, well, we have Ethernet-based diagnostic stuff coming in. We have Ethernet going into cars. That'll be interesting. Uh, we have CanFD, which is this new can with bigger frames, and you know, we'll need some new tools for that, but it's not really in any cars today. Vehicle APIs are starting to become a thing. Tesla gives you a REST kind of API to your car. Ford, a while ago, came out with OpenXC, which is an open access, you know, t open source tool you can use to access data beyond just OBD. It actually uses UDS, but they don't tell you that. And more tools based on, you know, a library that does UDS and CAN and ISOTP. Now it's pretty easy to write your own tools that, that do this stuff. And if you have problems, hopefully you'll help me fix them. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where I see this going. I work on car projects a bunch and kind of make contributions to things as I need tools. Uh, currently trying to take an electric vehicle powertrain out of a leaf and stick it in another car. So, you know, this kind of tooling is pretty useful when you're like, what's, what's going on in this CAN bus? But uh, yeah, that's my time and my pitch. Uh, you can find the source code for all this stuff on GitHub. You can email me or Twitters me or go to you know, either of those websites for more information on those things. I think we have a couple minutes and I'm happy to take questions, but thank you very much to the people who had me here and thank you very much to sticking out for the whole time. <laughs>Hey, is this on? Yeah. Oh, so, cool. I guess I can field questions, so yes. go ahead. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of a two-part. One, it seems like you're at the, the stage of, of messing this, with this stuff where you're just poking one memory address, like writing to it to see what, uh, what the value is. Um, what, is like, uh, what is the level of write access that you can get to this? So like, is it feasible to rewrite some functions of core functionality? So in a lot of cases, you can actually, and this requires some security access, but most of those are pretty broken. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you can actually just change the entire firmware binary running on the controller. So you can, you can change whatever you want. Uh, the harder part is actually getting that to work correctly. You don't have the original firmware. So you're going to need to either like patch the binary or write your own firmware for it. But a lot of the stuff that's a little bit more useful and interesting because of that is just peeking at the services themselves. So if there's, let's say you want to implement something that unlocks your doors, there might be a diagnostic service that unlocks your doors or a CAN frame you can send that unlocks your doors. So then you can actually develop your own tools that do, do that sort of functionality. Okay, um, and just kind of a quick follow up, like uh, how, how like uh, plug and play is it between manufacturers who if I have my Nissan Versa and I want to use the, the restraint system from this Toyota I have here, is that doable? Uh, I wish. Uh, so OBD is very across the board. Everyone implements OBDs mostly the same way. Actual functionalities, on the other hand, for so UDS, the actual read data by identifier, write data by identifier stuff, that is standardized. But what those data identifiers mean is not. Uh, there's whole ranges that are manufacturer specific and they can define themselves. And so you're kind of at the mercy of those people. So one thing that's nice is, you know, if you have one OEM, they tend to stick with it for all their cars. There are exceptions to even that, where you'll find, like, different cars that have totally different CAN buses, even though they came out of the same factory. Um, it, really, it really depends, is, is the answer. Okay, thank you. No problem. Over here. Does your tool support J1939? It does not yet, but I want to write that or find someone who wants to help write that. Uh, it does support, so the idea is to make it very hardware agnostic and then give you CAN frames and then make it pretty simple to you know, work on those. So the idea there is you know, if you wanted to implement J1939, you can have whatever CAN tool is supported by it and it should work across the board. Just a matter of like, I need to implement J1939. <laughs> and buying pricey PDFs, right? <laughs> yeah, 1939, there's a lot more information on. But uh, if anyone wants to, act, I meant to say this, if anyone wants to play around with this stuff, and if you stuck around, you're probably actually somewhat interested. Uh, I, I happen to have some of these tools, which I don't really want to bring through TSA. So <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I, can, I can dole some out if you want to you know, download this and actually have a CAN interface. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, cool. Eric. Thanks again, everybody.